My name is Kiki Fontenelle, and I'm the author of the book, The Louisiana Urban Gardener, A Beginner's Guide to Growing Vegetables and Herbs. And today we're going to discuss a little bit about the book. I'm going to read some of the inside for you guys listening. And I'm also going to talk about a few of the fruit and vegetables that I have sitting here on the table with me. All of these fruit and vegetables are from some of my grad student projects, some of our projects at the LSU Ag Center where I work, and um, one tomato from a good farmer of mine, farmer's friend of mine. So we'll be discussing this as people start to log in. So I see LSU Press is logged in, that's great. And we'll wait for a few more minutes for a few other people to just join in and, and start viewing with us. Hi, Elisa. One of the things that I'm gonna show you guys today is um, how fruit's supposed to be harvested and vegetables. When we say vegetables, um, I'm also gonna use that word interchangeably with fruit because many of the vegetables that you plant that we consider vegetables when we're cooking are actually fruit. So like this pepper here, for instance, botanically speaking is a fruit, even though most chefs or lay people, non-gardeners consider it a um, vegetable and it's a fruit because it's ovarian tissue. So if you would cut into this, you would see that it's tissue surrounding seeds. So that's why we are going to be discussing some of that as we go on in the book. And I see we've got a few people logged in now and we are gonna go ahead and get started. So again, today we're discussing the book, The Louisiana Urban Gardener, A Beginner's Guide to Growing Fruits and Vegetables. Uh, this book was put out about three years ago now, and I wrote it um, a, a, a year or two before that, and it was quite a feat for me. I, I wrote it while I was pregnant with my daughter, Charlotte, and so this was written late at night, um, sitting in a lazy boy most nights because I was so big I couldn't breathe. So today I wanted to show you guys a few things about the book, why we wrote the book the way we did, and how it's organized. So if you were opening up your book, whenever y'all order it, or if you already have it, you're gonna notice the table of contents starts out just as if you never had a garden before. So we start with introduction, who's gardening in Louisiana, and there's tons of people gardening. Um, home gardeners, commercial gardeners, uh, school gardeners, everybody's gardening, especially this year with COVID and we're all locked up at our own houses. So great time to start gardening. But um, it's choosing a best site, deciding whether you wanna be in ground or in the soil, what tools you need if you're going in the soil versus pots or raised beds, things of that manner. Feeding your soil with fertilizers, managing insects. And then we move on to the part everybody wants to know about, which is um, how to plant your vegetables. Now, this is the part that I think is great about this book. We've divided it into spring vegetables and summer vegetables for chapter six and fall and winter vegetables for chapter seven. And in each of those chapters, we have subheadings and they're divided by the family that the plants are in. So if we were looking at the table again here, we have um, peppers and a couple of tomatoes. And if we had some eggplants, those are all in the Solanaceae family. So it's divided like that, not just alphabetical order. Okay, the reason we did that is because when you're growing a garden at home, you want to rotate that pot or rotate that row or that raised bed. So if I were to plant pepper plants in there this spring, then I would wanna get out of that family. I wouldn't follow up with a potato crop because it's in the same family. I would follow it up with something in the cucurbit family, right? Or leafy greens like mustards for the fall, something of that nature. So that's why we wrote the book like that. So you would never accidentally keep planting things that are related, kind of like cousins are related together. So that being said, we're gonna go ahead and go to chapter six, and I'm flipping open to page 57, where we discuss gourds and pumpkins. And the reason I'm gonna talk about this or read you a little excerpt out of the book here is because if you want to plant pumpkins or gourds in your garden and you want them for October 1st, so you could decorate with them around your house for the entire month of October and even into Thanksgiving, then you'd really wanna plant those seeds right now into your garden. So we usually plant them late June, early July, usually by the 4th of July, which is coming up this Saturday. So still plenty of time to get those in the garden. I'm doing this in the house right now. And part of that reason is because if you go outside to my garden, you would see a bunch of zinnia flowers and you would see empty rows because we've already tilled up 
put in our fertilizer, and we're ready to plant our pumpkins this week. So that's what's going on at, at the house here, the Fontenot house um, for the 4th of July. No fireworks, just seeding pumpkins. But let's go ahead and start. So our planting dates, like I just said, mid-June to early July for a Halloween harvest. You can keep planting through August for a Thanksgiving harvest. Plantings can even continue through September, but will produce much later. So those might be the pumpkins that you wanna grow for pumpkin pies you're gonna even eat through Christmas day. Plant spacing. Space bush type pumpkins three feet apart and vining types six feet apart. Now, how do you know if it's a bush or a vining type? When you buy your seed package, it'll tell you there. Or if you're buying it in bulk, like these great seeds right here that I got from the Urban Farmer, which is kind of funny because it's the Urban Gardening book and I ordered a pound of pumpkin seed from them. But um, they won't tell you necessarily on this seed package, but when you go online to their catalog or you look um, in a catalog that might've been mailed to you at home, it'll describe how that plant grows to you right there. So bush types three feet apart, vining types six feet apart. Consider, consider skipping the adjacent row when planting vining types. So if you have a small garden, what I want you to do is plant every single row in your garden or plant the entire raised bed with the pumpkin seeds, but space the plants apart further in the row. If you have a big garden, you can skip every other row and squeeze your plants closer together. Either way, you're not gonna go wrong. They're all the vines are gonna run together. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna start covering up the fruit, which is really good. You wouldn't want your cantaloupes, your watermelon, your pumpkins sitting out and exposed. You want the vines going over them so they don't get sunburn spots. So that's a great thing to, to do. So typically we're gonna plant two to three seeds, pumpkin seeds um, per 10 feet a row, maybe up to six, depending on how close you're squeezing it in. And then we talk about what if you just have a container? Because you guys, you're a gardener, no matter if you have 100 foot rows or 10 foot rows or one raised bed, or maybe you live in an apartment and you have a single pot. I still consider you a gardener. And if you have a single pot and you wanna grow pumpkins, you can do it. The thing you need to think about is right here in the book, it tells you if you like to um, plant pumpkins in a pot, this plant is most suitable to a 10 gallon container or larger. So you might be thinking, Kiki, what's a 10 gallon container? Well, everybody has a five gallon bucket, right? You've used it outside to pick up trash or to mop your floors. Just think a, a, a pot or a container that's twice the size of a five gallon container that helps you visualize what that would look like. So then in the book, we start saying, okay, you've seeded your plants. All right, so now let's start talking about how you fertilize them or when do you fertilize them? Because a lot of brand new gardeners will go out and buy beautiful transplants, little seedlings, or they'll buy a bunch of seed and they'll just stick it in the ground and forget to feed it. Now, do we need to feed it? No. What feeds a plant? The sun, photosynthesis, right? But we give ourselves vitamins, so we wanna give our plants vitamins. So we really need to fertilize them so that we don't have these straggly looking plants. We have big, lush, beautiful vines, things that your neighbor's gonna be jealous of. That's what we're going for, okay? So we need to think about fertilizing our plants. Now y'all can fertilize um, using organic fertilizers, manures, um, uh, compost, that's all great. Uh, rabbit pellets, chicken pellets, um, anything like that is fine. Or you can use synthetic fertilizers like triple eight, triple 13, um, things of that manner. It doesn't matter to me, you just gotta feed your plants, all right? And in the fertilizer section, we do talk about all the different types of fertilizers. So right here, we're just um, saying in raised beds or in in-ground gardens, apply a complete fertilizer, such as a triple 13 to the soil at a heavy rate, one to three weeks prior to planting. Well, what's a heavy rate? Okay, that's a great question. So remember, the book was organized to talk about how to plant your plants before we talk about vegetable specifics. So if you go back to the fertilizer section, Right here on page 23, we have what low rate, medium rate, and heavy rate of fertilizers are. And when we give these directions, we give them both in pounds and in cups. So what we're trying to get all of you home gardeners to do is in your shed, keep a cup measure, just like you measure flour for a cake or something you know to grow in the kitchen. We want you guys to also measure your fertilizer, all right? We don't want excess nutrients ending up in the Mississippi River or in your local ditch or whatever you have. So it'll tell you right here. So for instance, a low rate would be about one cup of triple 13 for every 10 feet. 
and a heavy rate would be about three cups of triple 13 for every 10 feet of space that you're planting. Giving you kind of these bigger numbers because we're talking about pumpkins right now. So anyways, we get back here and we say water the fertilizer in and then you don't fertilize again. You apply side dress nitrogen fertilizer at the first bloom, okay? And then again, in weekly increments if you want to. Now with pumpkins, they're in the cucurbit family, just like your cantaloupe, just like your watermelon. So a lot of times, if you have a big garden, it's hard to keep fertilizing or wait till they bloom. So when the plant's growing, right as it looks like it's about to start vining out, that's when we put a little side dress fertilizer. In the fertilizer chapter, it tells you a side dress rate, or it's called side dress fertilizing, because if the plant were right here, this is the, the base of my plant, okay? I'm not gonna put the fertilizer right here. It explains in the book, you put the fertilizer to the side of the plant about six to eight inches away, all right? And that's going to allow those feeder roots to get that fertilizer and take it in. So we talk about that and we say, apply one to two teaspoons of about a 15% nitrogen source per plant. Again, we give you all kinds of tips on um, organic and synthetic fertilizers you can use. So we talk about how to fertilize here and then we say in the book, insects of concern. So for pumpkins, the insects of concern are aphids, worms, loopers, snails, and slugs. And I can tell you from experience, the ones that you're gonna probably have the most problems with are snails, worms, and slugs. And when you're looking at the leaves, the foliage of the plants, the worms are usually light, light green and on the underside of the leaf and they're gonna be feeding on it. When they're really tiny, you're not gonna see them. And then all of a sudden you'll start seeing the holes get larger and larger. And you know, you probably have worms out there. When they're done eating your foliage, they will start eating down your pumpkins. So I really want you guys to go out at least twice a week if you're growing pumpkins and look hard for worms, snails, and slugs. Snails and slugs love to eat the fruit or the rind of the pumpkins. And so you've gotta control those with baits. Now. Once again, Kiki, you know, you guys might be asking me, all right, you're saying here's all the insects of concern, but what do I do about that? Well, if you look in the book and we go, and I have little cheap bookmarks here, we go here to the insect section, managing the insects in your garden. I hope I didn't use the word control because controlling insects is 100% impossible. Managing them, that's a little bit more possible. But what we have here is we have a table and this is on page 26 and 27 and it tells you all the different major types of insects we have here in Louisiana and then next to it it gives you an organic chemical control and a synthetic chemical control so you can look in here and you can say okay worms and if we're talking about worms on our edible plants organically we can hand pick it's going to be hard unless you just have one or two plants or you can spray Bacillus thundurensis, BT, which is a naturally occurring bacteria. You're gonna um, go to the plant store and ask them for BT, just say the initials B as in boy, T as in Tom, and they will show you a whole host of different trade names this comes under. Probably the one that most people are familiar with is Dipel dust, so that would be something you could spray. If you wanted to go synthetic, you don't, you're not worried about organic, you can apply things like carbaryl, seven, seven dust, um, spinosad products, pyrethroids, or bifenthrin products. So all of those, again, can easily be found at any um, local plant nursery that you have around whatever part of the state you happen to be in. So I live in St. Gabriel, and the closest nursery to me, uh, well, we have the St. Gabriel hardware store, they carry all these products. But if I were to drive into Baton Rouge, I would go to Clegg's or I would go to Louisiana Nursery. Places like that are gonna specifically carry the products that you want, both organic and synthetic. So that's how you kind of see, okay, these are the insects of concern and the book helps you determine what to spray for them. It's not a long read, so you don't have to worry about, you know, reading an encyclopedia. We try to condense down the information in something easy for you to um, understand. And then of course, diseases of concern, downy mildew, powdery mildew, anthracnose. Those are gonna be a little bit harder for you to identify if you've never gardened before. So you might do something like call your county agent. So you could go to www.lsuagcenter.com and that'll tell you who your county agents are. And you could pick your parish and then call that person and ask them questions. 
You can find me on the internet, my email's up there, and you can ask us away too. But really, getting to know your county agent is gonna help you learn what garden programs are available in your local area. So definitely trust those guys, they know what they're talking about. Um, one of the things I wanted to show you in the book that I really like is we have um, a, like a date right here, and it says day one, we plant seed, day 85 to 120, we begin harvest, right? But in between, we give you some steps. Days five to seven, gonna be germination. In the heat that we have out right now, if your soil's moist, I guarantee you'll probably see your pumpkins popping up through the soil day three or four. Um, days 10 to 14, it says the first true leaf develops. Okay, for every crop, no matter if it's pumpkins, tomatoes, cucumbers, whatever in this, I give you that date for the first true leaf to develop. If you are growing these seeds inside to start, let's say, or in small containers and you're gonna pop them in the garden later, you never wanna fertilize them till they've come up and that first true leaf is developed. So when you're looking at a plant, the first two leaves that come out are gonna look like this. That's your cotyledon leaves. Those aren't true leaves. But that third leaf that pops up in between those, that's your first true leaf. And after that comes up, you know it's safe to fertilize a small plant without burning it up if you measure and you use correct rates. But I just wanted to tell you why we had that um, in the book. And here we have, if you had seeded them ahead of time, your pumpkin seeds and, and six packs or egg crates or whatever, then days 21 through 28, we transplant them into the garden. Then we kind of give some fun general tips right here. And that's the way you use the book. And it tells you exactly what to plant and how to plant. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that over here for a little bit. And if any of you guys have any questions, go ahead and chime in. I can kind of see some of this here on the side. And I'm looking to see if there's any questions. Um, and I see that we don't have any right now, so that's okay. So what I'm gonna talk about are other related crops to pumpkins to start. So cantaloupe is one, right? So it's in the cucurbit family as well. So if you just harvested a bunch of cantaloupe or watermelon out of your garden, then I don't want you to go right back in that same area with pumpkins. Remember, we need to rotate out of the family. So let's skip over a few rows and plant in a different area. But if you have cantaloupe in your garden, you um, are probably wondering how to harvest them. These were just harvested yesterday. I have a grad student. His name is Vondel Reyes, very smart young man. And these are from his plots. He's actually doing a food safety project, but we had to grow all of our fruit um, fresh for the project. So how do we know? A lot of people say smell it. So mm, smells good like a cantaloupe, right? But what if you have a stuffed up nose? What if you can't bend over and smell it? How else can you tell? On a cantaloupe, you want the rind to develop. So you want to see that nice rough texture, right? If it looks really smooth, it's probably not ready to pick. And the most foolproof way to tell if this cantaloupe is ready to pick is if it slips. So what you'll do is when it's on the vine, you'll, this is where the stem broke off the cantaloupe, you literally put your finger like this and if it hangs and stays on the vine, it's not ready. But if it falls off, it's ready to pick. So a lot of times our cantaloupe, you'll just see they've rolled literally off the vine and you can go in and they're perfectly fine and ripe to pick. Now, everything on here was grown um, by us at LSU Ag Center, except for this watermelon. I don't have watermelon trials this year. I wish I did. Last year I did, and a coyote ate every single one of my watermelon. So I'm not a friend of the coyotes these days. They're tr we're trying to trap them. They just, they're too smart for our traps is the problem. But here's a watermelon, and you might be looking at this one, I'm trying to see if I can get it right at the angle. You see how it kind of has a triangular shape to it? Kind of goes up and triangular. That's a characteristic usually of a seedless watermelon. Sometimes it's poorly pollinated, but most seedless watermelons kind of have this shape. This is the stem end here, all right? And then the blossom end is down here. How do we know it's ready to harvest? A lot of people say that the stem will shrivel up, like you can see this one here. Some people say that the tendril, which I don't have on this one, but the tendril closest to it will dry out. And that usually coincides with fruit ripening. But remember the stem and the tendrils are not part of the fruit, okay? This fruit right here needs, you need to find an indicator on the fruit. 
And so the way when you're looking at the watermelon in your garden is you roll them over with your foot. And do you see how on the bottom of this one, the coloring is light yellow and the stripes are starting to fade out right here? That's indicating to me that this watermelon is ready to pick, okay? So if it were still the same stripe pattern as on the top, on the bottom, it's gonna be light, light pink inside. It's not gonna be ready, okay? So you really want this yellow spot. If this yellow spot is just pale white, keep it in the garden still. It's gonna further develop yellow. If your yellow spot starts looking kind of deeper yellow, almost orangey and has some black growing on it, pick it. It might be a little overripe, but that's how you tell on a nice big watermelon like this right here. So remember, those are all related. Same with cucumbers. Um, we get a lot of questions, and I don't have one with me right now, um, about cucumbers, what are the best varieties, how to grow them. These right here are all um, Dasher 2s. Dasher 2 is my favorite uh, cucumber variety on the market, and um, they do really well. They're all about seven, eight inches in length and about an inch in size. If you see little damage like this on your cucumber, that's not insects or disease. That's just where it was, as it was developing, it was brushing against the leaves. Or if you have them trellised up in your garden, it might have just been hitting the twine in your garden. Nothing to worry about, perfectly edible. Wouldn't be great if you were trying to sell it at the grocery store, but absolutely nothing wrong with that cucumber right there. Um, since we're on cucurbits right now, I'm gonna talk about these beautiful zinnias right here. So why did I take everything out of my garden except these flowers if I'm about to plant pumpkins. The reason is when you're thinking about cucurbits, so the cantaloupe, the watermelon, the pumpkins, the cucumbers, the male and female flowers are on the same vines but separated. So you need bees or insects, flies, beetles, um, anything like that. Um, hummingbirds don't go to those as much, but butterflies, right, to move that pollen to the female flower. So you really wanna attract insects to the garden. So I always plant zinnias or sunflowers or cosmos. Um, I even will plant basil out there and let it go to flower just to attract the pollinators. So like, again, right now my whole garden is empty except for these flowers right now. So they're beautiful as bouquets. Um, they're, they're just gorgeous and they're great to give away to your family and friends, but it's something to definitely consider integrating this in with your vegetables. And we talk about that in the book as well, how to attract those pollinators to your garden. It's just super important. So definitely get that going in there. A lot of people worry, um, can I plant a tomato next to a cucumber, next to a flower, next to an herb? Yes, there's no right or wrong pattern. You can have full rows of any of this or you can mix it up as much as you want to. So I'm just gonna go down to see question. Laura, can the coriander seeds from your cilantro plant be saved for next spring? If so, is there anything special you have to do regarding storing or saving seeds for replanting? Great question, Laura. Um, yes, you can save all your seeds, okay? You can save them from your herbs and they're really easy to tell because they look exactly like the herb that you're planting or that you're using in your, in your um, kitchen, right? So you wanna get them when they're fully mature, completely dried out. And then if you're gonna save them, I would put them in a paper envelope because if there is any moisture still in there, you want that moisture wicked away, not in a plastic bag, but a paper envelope, write the plant on the outside of the envelope and store it in the refrigerator or in the freezer until next season and you're ready to plant. So you can do that with lettuce seeds, pea seeds, any of your herbs. You could do it um, if you were gonna say, you know, pepper seeds or tomato seeds, any of that, it's no problem. Now remember, if you're growing hybrids, okay, um, and they're not open pollinated, the pepper seeds in here, if you had three or four different types of peppers in your garden, they may be true to type or they may be cross pollinated depending on how much insect movement you have in there. So what you get from a hybrid seed may not always look like, you know, the same mother plant. In the case of coriander, it's gonna be pretty much the same. It's gonna look pretty good. So I think you'll be fine. Okay, um, Tiffany has a question about county. What's a county? Yes, Tiffany, we live in Louisiana and even though we call them county agents, they are parish agents. Um, so look for your parish um, on the LSU Ag Center map. And the, when it says a county agent, because that's what they're called in all the other 49 states, 
it'll be the same thing as a parish agent or someone to help you out locally. So let's see here. Um, somebody wishes their melons and pumpkins were growing fruit. They forgot to fertilize. You got it for next year. Fertilize it. Um, Laura asked, uh, sun is important for a garden, but and but for what plants, especially summer plants, do fairly well, well in partial sun. Okay, so all of the plants that I have here are gonna need full sun. Anything that is a plant that develops a flower and then that flower turns into a fruit, so your eggplant, peppers, tomatoes, melons, cucumbers, they are all gonna need six to eight hours of direct sunlight. So that could be morning or afternoon, but you're gonna need morning and a little afternoon or all afternoon and a little morning to make that work, okay? Um, if you wanna plant the fall garden, fall gardens only need about five, six, maybe seven hours of sunlight. So your lettuce, spinach, all your root crops, carrots, radishes, those do well with less sunlight. So you might have a really great fall garden, and if you have a lot of shade, you're going to have a mediocre summer garden. No matter how much fertilizer and other things you do to them, it's just really hard. But what I have seen a lot of people do that have giant trees in their yard is they'll take their summer plants and maybe their garden space doesn't get quite as much sun, they'll put them in pots and kind of put them down the driveway or along a sidewalk or somewhere where they get a little bit more sun. And uh, Danielle, I'm glad you're growing zinnias too to attract those bees. And Heather, they do make beautiful cut flowers. Um, let's see here, Gavin, you say, um, having failed with potatoes and tomatoes, what's the easiest vegetable to grow? And top tip, apart from the flowers in vicinity. This is to grow in the UK, all right? So potatoes and tomatoes are related. So if you have a hard time with one, you might have a hard time with the other. As far as easiest crops to grow, um, I would say the root crops, okay? So your carrots, your radish, your beets, turnips, those are all gonna be um, very easy to grow. The key, to easy, they're easy to grow, but the key to making them look pretty, right? So a really round radish or a really round beet or a nice long carrot is to plant them in soils that are sandier because they can move easier through that. If you have heavy, heavy clay soils in the UK or wherever you are growing right now, then it's gonna be a little bit harder, right? To get them to not be curved or a little bit misshaped. So if your soils are full of clay, plant your root crops in, in pots, right? And then just use a nice potting soil for them and you'll get the same effect. Or build raised beds, you know, um, make them at least 10, 12 inches deep so that you have adequate soil and you'll have nice, beautiful root crops. The reason I say root crops are, the new trend with root crops like your uh, beets and your turnips um, is to not let them get the full mature size, you know, like that four to five inch around but to harvest them more, um, maybe an inch and a half, two inches around, like the size of a silver dollar, because uh, a lot of the fancy chefs or people who like to cook a lot, what they're saying is they like to whole roast those vegetables. And that makes it even easier on us gardeners, right? Because we um, get our soil ready, we loosen it up. On our root crops, we always direct seed those. You're not gonna plant them in, in little cups and start them ahead of time. And then you're gonna water them. And as they come up, maybe you know four or five weeks you might side dress one time and boom you've already got those um, nice size root crops uh, carrots maybe a 50 day 40 day crop radishes 28 days so if you have feel like you have a um, a brown thumb and you can't grow i'd say start with those or start with mustard greens they make you uh, gain confidence very quickly so that would all be um, great great crops to start with if you feel like you need a little help Okay, LSU Press has a question. How do you keep birds from feasting on your tomatoes? Okay, LSU Press, um, whoever can answer this question gets a million dollars if they can market it and develop it. Birds love tomatoes, okay, they just do. Um, I know in strawberry crops, some people will paint rocks red and put them out there and they'll peck on those and then they get kind of annoyed. But once a bird has found your garden, like this year we have a big, uh, blueberry trial going on and we had to put bird netting up because once the birds find you they start telling their friends about you everybody knows about your garden and they're coming in to feast 
And unfortunately, birds don't just eat the entire tomato, like on this cherry tomato, they would just peck one side of it and then they'd go peck all 30 other ones sitting on the bush. I just want them to eat one whole tomato. So what do we do? We can put out flashy silver tape. Um, you can go to Hobby Lobby, Walmart. Um, you can go to, again, your local nurseries like Clegg sells it, but it's double-sided shiny ribbon and you tie it onto your tomato steaks and you just let it blow like this in the wind. That helps. Putting pie plates, old CDs kind of helps. Um, but if you really want to savor every single one, you might have to put some bird netting up. Uh, that's pretty much the only foolproof way to keep them out of your garden. Some people say get a cat, you know, get a dog. I don't know. It's tough. Um, Sarah asked, um, any edible flowers we can grow to do the double duty of attracting pollinators for adding to dishes? Of course, there are lots of edible flowers out there. Um, violas, uh, pansies, those are really edible. Um, people like those a lot. All of your herbs that you're growing, any of those flowers coming off your herbs, very much edible. So chive flowers, um, rosemary flowers, basil flowers, dill flowers. So you got double, double duty, right? You can eat the flowers, you can eat the foliage, and you're attracting the pollinators. So any of those really work um, just fine. I don't think I'd eat the zinnia flowers. Okay, let's see here. Um, nasturtium flowers, definitely um, very good, uh, good edible flower right there. And then feeding, I like Maggie, uh, fill your bird feeder up. Uh, we also get squirrels. You guys, squirrels will come in they, and they like to eat from my bird feeder. And then in the spring, they pretty much leave my garden alone, but in the fall, they love to eat our broccoli and our cabbage and our cauliflower plants. So that's always, you know, hard to go like that. So um, I wanna kind of show y'all a few other things on here. On your peppers, y'all probably have peppers growing in the garden right now. This is a beautiful pepper, right? Um, we have these nice big peppers that we've, we've harvested green. And what I'm doing is I'm letting them slightly mature inside my house, right? I'm letting them turn red colors here because if we leave them outside to ripen, we're gonna get a big blemish on them. Um, stink bugs are out like crazy right now. They're gonna be poking into these diseases are really hard on us in June and July. But if you let them ripen on your table or in your windowsill, you get beautiful color. And you can pick them like this when they're just starting to blush and let them fully ripen inside. But I have a little pepper hidden here somewhere. That I was gonna show you guys that I've now lost. Uh, well, anyways, what I wanted to tell y'all was if you're feeling any of your peppers and they feel kind of sticky, like they have sticky residue on them, you probably have aphids on them. Peppers are a magnet for aphids. And so this time of year when it's really hot, I don't want you to spray oils on them. I want you to spray soaps. The book will tell you, you can spray either oils or soaps, but soaps would be better because it's not gonna burn the foliage as bad. But it, what it does is on those little tiny soft bodied insects, it suffocates them. So it sort of smothers them out and they die and then your peppers come off a lot nicer. You would have to repeat those applications every five to seven days because their eggs are gonna start hatching. So just wanted to let y'all know that's a good tip. I don't know where my sticky aphid pepper went now, but it was up here earlier. Um, let's see, I'm gonna scroll down to make sure I'm not missing any questions because I know we're getting to the end of our time. Um, Bunnies eat broccoli, they do. Squirrels and pests, um, yeah, they're definitely pests in the garden. Um, used coffee grounds work great as squirrel repellent. That's a great uh, tip, Laura. I've never used that one. I have done the cayenne pepper out there and it gets on their little paws and they, don't, they lick it and they don't like it. Here in Louisiana, it works if we have a stretch without rain. Um, but once we have rain, that smell and that, um, that seasoning goes away. Um, some people will go to barbershops and collect human hair clippings and put that out, um, dryer sheets out, anything with a smell. But again, here in Louisiana with our summers, we have a lot of rain events and after one or two rains, the smell goes away. So just know you're gonna have to reapply that kind of thing. So um, I'm trying to see if there's anybody else with any questions behind, oh, my cantaloupe. What's behind my cantaloupe? I don't know. These are some cherry tomatoes. These are called uh, sweethearts of the patio. They're very thick, very tasty, delicious little cherry tomatoes. Um, definitely add one to your garden. If you guys want to plant tomatoes now, it's not too late. It's definitely still time now through the end of July. 
you can plant tomato plants, not seeds, but plants into the garden. And um, what you wanna do is you wanna choose some that are heat set. So right now, if you were to go outside in the evening, it's gonna be, after it's completely dark, it's still gonna be probably greater than 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And when the temperatures are so high like that at night, the, the pollen is damaged on tomato um, flowers. And when the pollen's dam damaged, it doesn't actually set fruit. What you'll get is the misshapen fruit, or if enough pollen doesn't get in and fertilize the seeds, then you're just, you're not gonna have fruit set at all. So we go with tomatoes, if you wanna plant them this time of year um, at your house, that have heat-like names. Um, Phoenix, right, is a really hot place. Florida, so Florida 91s, those are great tomatoes. Um, Sunset, Sun Leaper, Sun Master, uh, those kind of tomatoes are gonna be really, really good and all their names connotate heat. So that's gonna be helpful for you if you wanna plant tomatoes right now in the garden. Um, Maria wants to know about cinnamon. Okay, Maria, I don't know if you wanna know about cinnamon to repel squirrels or if you wanna know about growing cinnamon. Cinnamon, y'all, is the bark of a tree. I tried planting a cinnamon tree at on LSU's campus to show some of the students and it promptly died this winter. Um, cinnamon trees are only hardy to about zone 10. So even in New Orleans, I think, I can't remember, but we're either zone 9A, zone 9B. So cinnamon trees are just a little bit, we're not tropical quite enough um, for them here in Louisiana, unless you had um, maybe a greenhouse you wanted to try to grow it in, or if you wanted to grow it in, say you guys live in like a patio home with a nice um, nook area. You have high walls, you know, kind of surrounding a little patio. You could try to plant it there and then wheel it in for the winter. Or I've seen where people will put their tropical plants next to the dryer vents outside of their house, like where your, your washer and your dryer vent out of the house, because that extra heat from the dryer vent will keep those tropical plants um, still going so they don't quite freeze during a freeze. So that might be helpful. Oh, she says, no, the, the pepper is behind the cantaloupe. I guess it is. Oh, here it is. Here's my sticky pepper. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, I don't know if y'all can see, but do you see those little small insects stuck to that pepper? And it's kind of shiny. That's because it has the aphid um, secretions all over it. You're gonna know you have aphids in your garden because your fruit's gonna be sticky like this. And also because you might see ants running up and down the plants. And ants farm aphids, they like aphids because the aphids secrete that sugary substance that they like to eat. So it's kind of a double whammy. If you get a lot of aphids, you're also gonna get ants. And nobody wants ants in their garden. Yes, they till up the soil and they make it easier for our plants to grow, but they bite us. So um, it's a double problem. So spray those soaps to get rid of the aphids in the garden. And my mom joined us. Thank you, mom, for coming on. That's really sweet. Um, my favorite large tomato variety um, is going to be Bellarosa. Bellarosa makes a beautiful, big red tomato. It um, is great in the spring. It's tomato spotted wilt, um, tomato spotted wilt virus resistant. It's a mouthful. Um, and it's also a heat set tomato. So you can also plant it into this time of year um, and it's gonna do fine th for, through the first killing frost. Uh, as far as cherries, I like Sun Gold and I love one called Chocolate Sprinkles. Chocolate Sprinkles is a beautiful, tasty little tomato. So let's see. I like how everybody can see where my sticky cantaloupe is. I mean, my sticky pepper, Kevin Allen. <laughs> um, thank you, Stephanie. And Ray Ann, Allen, I have lots of ants in my garden. Should I allow them to stay or kill them? Never knew about the aphids and ants. Yes, ants are very strong uh, animals and they are survivors. They will, heart, they will farm other uh, insects. They will do anything to survive. So in your garden, if you, wanna, if you don't mind the ant pile being in there, you can leave it. They're not gonna hurt your vegetables at all, except for increasing aphid concentrations. But if you wanna get rid of them so you don't get bit, then you need to look for certain products. A lot of the products that kill ants are gonna be baits. Baits are best placed um, out, not right before rain, so they don't get washed out. Um, so there's a product called Extinguish that works really great for ants. And if you have raised beds, pots, even like an in-ground garden, I always suggest shaking it around the perimeter of the garden or around the outside of the raised bed. Remember, it's a bait. 
So the ants are gonna come out of the garden and they're gonna go out and they're gonna feed it or bring it back into the queen. So um, Extinguish, there's a product if you want to be all organic um, called uh, Come and Get It. Come and Get It, the active ingredient is spinosad. And so again, it's spinosad's used for many insects in the garden, but um, the ants will go out and get it. But again, you're not gonna put it right next to the vegetable plants. You're gonna put it around the perimeter of the garden and that'll help you control some of the ants. So um, it, it's just uh, just something that we, we deal with, especially down here in South Louisiana. Um, if there's any other questions, I'll stay on for another couple minutes. If not, you guys, the Louisiana Urban Gardener is an excellent book. You can find it at LSU Press's website. They're the ones who hosted this Facebook Live today, and I believe they were gonna put up a discount code for it. So if you're interested in the book, it's a great read. Um, it's definitely um, it's definitely written for the first time and beginning gardeners. So don't be scared, you know, just go out and start with any plant, any vegetable, you'll be fine. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy gardening and y'all y'all do really well. And I'm trying to think of other tips I can share with you right now. The ants are not eating your, your leaves, Ran. Um, one of the insects that's out right now that I'm seeing in our trial gardens, they um, actually, I had um, one of my farmers, Sam Farms, they're out in Derrida, Louisiana. If you guys are ever in Derrida and y'all are looking for a corn maze or harvesting your own pumpkins, they do, you pick strawberries, they do all kinds of cool stuff. You can shoot skeet at CM Farms, really cool farm. Um, uh, Chuck's son called me at 6.30 this morning and something's eating their pumpkin leaves. Their pumpkins just came up. They planted about a week ago and it's cucumber beetles. So everybody listening probably knows what a ladybug looks like, right? It's little red and black polka dots. Cucumber beetles look like ladybugs, but they are green. So they're gr light green with dark green polka dots or black polka dots, or they're light green with darker green stripes on them, but they're about the size and they look exactly like a ladybug, but just green and black or dark and light green and they will feed on your foliage. They will eat it and it looks like little bite marks. Because when you think about um, insects, it's, if I can't see the insect, it's hard for me to identify it, but if I can see what the holes look like in the plant, it helps. So if it looks like something's been eating like bites out of it, like you eat a bite out of a sandwich, that's generally a worm or a beetle because they have mandibles, so they eat like this. So it's like big bite marks out of it. Versus, and of course this, my tomatoes are gonna look really good and I didn't do this on purpose, you guys, but versus something like this right here, maybe, I don't, I don't know if it's gonna zoom in good enough, but if you have just like a yellow dot on your tomato, that's gonna be an insect with a piercing mouth part. So it's gonna pierce in there and suck some of the sap out. So you're not gonna have a hole, you're just gonna have discoloration that looks like little dots or your leaves might have little dots all over them that are discolored. So what that's gonna be is like, an aphid or um, a stink bug or something like that that's, that's sucking the sap out. So again, those LSU County agents who are in our parishes, if you can text them pictures of those, um, the damage on your leaves or you know on your fruit or on your vegetables, they can help you identify what's going on and what insect it is and, and how to spray it because it's hard to tell sometimes. Others. Um, I've heard of using a yellow solo cup with Vaseline on it to trap aphids. Do you know if this actually works? Faye, um, it's a great indicator. So what you can do is you can take a yellow solo cup or you can take an old um, stick, paint it yellow and rub Vaseline on it and small insects are gonna get stuck to it. And what that's doing is that's showing us how many insects you have in the garden. So you people will use that and say, okay, just a few insects are stuck to my cup or stuck to my stick. I'm not gonna worry about spraying. Okay, now half my stick's covered with these things. Uh-oh, I'll probably lose a little bit of, fol of um, foliage or fruit here. So I'm gonna start spraying because it's met a threshold that I'm no longer comfortable with. Um, one of the ways I've seen people use this, um, Malcolm Tucker, who grew this tomato right here, he came up with a fabulous idea the other day and it worked great. He grows greenhouse tomatoes. So what Malcolm did was he took an old, um, political sign that he had and he covered it with the yellow sticky tape. Now, um, Faye, you could paint it yellow and you could cover it with Vaseline, right? And he went in his greenhouse with a leaf blower and had one of his workers walk on this side of the plants with this yellow sticky board, right? 
and he blew the foliage over on this side and all the white flies and aphids and small body, not big like stink bugs, but they all got stuck to that sign. And they walked through and they did the greenhouse several times. So you could try it in your outdoor garden. Just get an old sign, um, paint it yellow and cover it with Vaseline and walk down it and gently blow them with your leaf blower and try to get some of that adult population out. And that's going to help them stop having babies so quickly and help you get them under control with the soaps and, and things of that nature. So yes, it's a good idea. It's a great way to just sort of monitor what's happening in your garden. Okay. All right, Gavin, you're welcome. Donna, yes, I'll autograph. You know I will. Donna's one of my good friends, y'all. Donna Lee is a county agent. She's so smart. If you live in Northeast Louisiana, call her. She will answer your questions. Um, okay, great. I'm glad you guys had fun. Uh, there's CM's website. Any advice for growing carrots in Southwest Louisiana grant? Uh, yes, again, um, try to get in the sandiest part of your garden. And if it's just straight clay, buy, uh, build a raised bed at least 12 inches deep and grow those carrots there. When y'all are planting carrot seed, we're not gonna start carrots in cups and transplant them to the garden. We're gonna direct seed them straight into the garden. So what I want you to do is sprinkle them on top of the soil and then water it in, okay? Because if you take your finger and you dig that little line or you take the back of your shovel and you make that little line and sprinkle the seed and then you pat it in and then you water that seed in, that seed's gonna move even further down. So it's not gonna, you're not gonna get good germination. Sprinkle the seed on top of the garden and gently water it in with a water breaker. Don't hold your thumb over the, over the end of the hose and you'll get great germination on your carrots. It's all about a little bit of light hitting that seed for those to grow. And I believe I wrote that tip in the book too. I'm pretty sure that tip's in there. So I want you guys to um, check that out. Uh, let's see, lots, yes, Faye, tons of great gardening groups on Facebook. I belong to a few of them. Um, Marlis, that's my mom, y'all. She wants to know what about that big green caterpillar on the tomatoes? She called me the other day, y'all, and that big green caterpillar ate down her entire or a side of her um, tomato plant in one night. Those are tomato hornworms. They are out um, fast and furious right now. The easiest way to spot them is when you have one stalk coming up and no leaves on it anymore. Search, search, search. He's gonna be about the size of your thumb and you're gonna have to take him from the plant and rip him off because they have like suction cups on the bottom of their feet and they're going to just just suction themselves to that plant. So I want you to pull them off, throw them as far as you can into the grass or into your yard and let a bird find them before he can crawl back up, okay? If you find one, there's more than just one. Keep looking, there's gonna be more, okay? Again, that's a worm, so the BT or the dipel dust, you can use spinosad products, you can use um, imidacloprid. Now you guys, if you're using imidacloprid, there's two ways to put it out, as a drench on the soil or to spray the foliage. Spraying the foliage, I think you have to wait five, seven days after spraying to harvest. If you drench the soil, it's 21 days. So don't use that if you have red tomatoes on the plant. You, it's just not a good idea. Whenever y'all are spraying any insecticides, pesticides, whether it's a fungicide or a herbicide or anything like that in the garden, you've got to read the label because there's these kind of silly little nuances in there, but it could make or break you harvesting your crop. So we want to, we want to know about that. They had um, tomato hornworms, seven dust, yes. Uh, seven dust will, um, that's a great question, Faye. She's asking, will seven dust kill a pollinator? So we live in a world where we have to balance out things, right? Technically for our tomatoes and our peppers, we don't need bees because the flowers are perfect. They have both female and male um, parts on them. So just a little wind, they self-pollinate, they make their fruit. That doesn't mean we want to kill the insects in the garden because we want them for our other plants, right? So what we need to do is be careful. If you're spraying fungicides or insecticides in the garden, and y'all, I don't care if they're organic or synthetic, it's still a side, C-I-D-E, that means it kills. That's, I think it's Latin, I could be wrong, maybe Greek, I don't know, but it means kill, right? So we, it will hurt or could hurt the honeybees. So what do we do? We only apply these kind of chemicals um, or like not late, but like at dusk. So the honeybees are usually active in the morning, in the afternoon, and then they go back to their hives in the early evenings. If you absolutely have to spray insecticides in the garden, 
do it in the early um, evening and try to avoid neonicotinoids. So that will help um, your gardeners out there. It's it's a hard balance. I have some some leaf footed bugs right now in my zinnias, but I'm not spraying them. I'm letting them be because I'd rather just see the the butterflies and the bees and all that enjoy them. I'm just going to let them be too. I'm, I'm making that call. Um, let's see here. All right, Grant, I hope you do get the book. Um, and I think if there's no other questions, we're 20 minutes past our time, but it's been really great talking to you guys. Um, I hope y'all enjoy the book. I hope you guys enjoy gardening at home. Um, again, talk to your local county agents if y'all have specific questions for your garden. And I hope y'all have a wonderful day. See you later.